that fields coming to the end of their lives will, will somehow last forever. It's, it's not realistic. Now, with your extra MSPs, which you were very quick to mention, um, the Scottish Greens have an <laughs> incredibly powerful position in this parliament. You've been talking at your conference about how your support for the SNP's budget would be conditional on various things like fracking and, and, and air passenger duty. But that's not the real power you have. The real power you have is they can't have another independence referendum unless you back them. I think it would be quite wrong for any political party to use the fact of minority government uh, simply to start playing games like that. Uh, I'm not going to trade off our support for a policy that we agree with in exchange for completely separate issues. I think the case needs to be strengthened uh, for independence, and I would agree uh, with Gordon Wilson to that, to that point. Not, not necessarily sure I would agree with, on all of the, the arguments that he might want to put, but the case needs to be strengthened. Uh, fundamentally, this is a conflict, though, between two referendum results. I understand well, well, and hang on. Let, let, let's come on to that in a, remain. Let's come on to that in a moment. Okay. But, but, but the real power okay. you have is you can say to the SNP government, if you abolish air passenger duty, we won't vote for a second referendum. If you don't ban fracking, we won't vote for a second referendum. Now, I've always understood from you and from other people in the Greens that independence for you is more a tactical thing. It's not your be-all and end-all and obsession. It's just a way of you getting the kind of green policies you want. So why subordinate the green policies you want and turn independence into some sort of principle? Uh, the, the, the idea of, of Scotland becoming independent is absolutely a means to an end, a means of achieving the fairer Scotland that we would be more able to deliver with the powers of independence. It's not a bargaining chip. It's not a bargaining chip to be Why pushed not? across the table in exchange for separate issues. Because I think that would be an entirely unethical way to do politics. You know, we will argue the case on fracking as we have done, and we've succeeded in pushing the, the Scottish Government, first of all, to add underground coal gasification to that moratorium, and then to ban it altogether. I'm very confident that working alongside all those who support a ban on fracking, we will achieve that. I think actually the, the Tories okay, but, typing up but, and saying how brilliant fracking would be helps make our case for that. But why would you block the... That we're going why to would you... On the budget, we're going to argue for progressive taxation and make sure that we can protect the public services that we need to value in Scotland. Why would you block their budget but not block their referendum? After all, it's on their referendum that you have the power. Unless they give in to what you want, they simply can't have it. You've got immense leverage when it comes to, to, to the referendum. They'll find other people in other parties to support them on their budget, but only you can deliver their referendum. Well, I think it remains to be seen whether they'll find other support on the budget, and the, the new finance secretary is going to have to give some ground from the SNP's manifesto position uh, if he wants to persuade others to support the budget. But... No, the, the idea that we would uh, drop a, a policy that we support, the idea of uh, supporting independence or of putting that to the electorate uh, on, on the basis of, of a, a grubby deal about other issues, I don't think that would be principled at all. Look, we've, we've got a conflict between the way Scotland voted in 2014 and 2016. I know and respect that not everyone who voted Remain this year will suddenly want to switch and support independence. But similarly, we also have to respect the fact that not everyone who voted No in 2014 is willing to see Scotland dragged out of Europe against our will, surrendering rights, having rights taken away from people that we did not vote to surrender. 62% of us voted to Remain, and that mandate is being utterly disregarded by the UK government. And I think this, the case is strong that the Scot people of Scotland need at least the possibility of having that question put to them so that they can resolve that conflict in the only way that is legitimate, a democratic process, a vote of all the people, including the people who were denied a vote in this year's EU referendum, like 16 and 17-year-olds and EU nationals whose lives okay. are now in such turmoil uh, as a result but of that. isn't your argument there, from a democratic point, point of view, a bit iffy to say that somehow or other... A pretty clear referendum vote that was made two years ago was now cast into doubt. I mean, it's also a bit patronising to the people of Scotland. I mean, many people who voted no will say, I'm sorry, Mr Harvey, we, we understood perfectly well what we voted for. We want to be part of the United Kingdom. And for you to start 
claiming that somehow um, we didn't know what we were doing, uh, therefore we have to vote again. Sorry, we're not having it. I, I don't claim for a moment that people didn't know what they were doing. We had a, a long and engaging uh, debate in the, in the long run up to that campaign. But the, the reality is, if you voted no and then you voted remain, you're not going to get what you want. So we have to resolve this fundamental conflict. And yes, there would be many people who voted no who are willing to leave the European Union, but there are also people who voted no uh, who believed better together when they said that voting yes would put our future in Europe at risk and voting no would safeguard it. Well, that was a piece of nonsense, just as much as many of the lies of the, of the Leave campaign this year were shown to be utterly spurious nonsense. And so there is a, a real conflict a fundamental conflict between the results of the way people in Scotland voted in these two referendums. Well, your argument there might have some credibility. Had there been a big upsurge in the polls in favour of either having a second referendum or voting for independence, but there, there hasn't been. So, of course, a lot of people in Scotland will say, well, thank you very much, Mr Harvey, for uh, sympathising with our alleged democratic deficit, but you're just making this up. Well, We're not interested. what the polls are showing is that I think what the polls are showing is that there has been movement in both directions. And it may be that the overall number in the polls has only gone up a little, but there has been movement in both directions. And that is before we see the real consequences of the hard Brexit that seems to be the, the new intention. You know, the UK government taking a 52% result across the UK and turning that into a mandate for a hard Brexit, taking us out not only of the European Union itself, but also out of the single market with all of the economic consequences that will have for people's jobs, for people's incomes, uh, for whole industries. You know, we've uh, just been speaking to, to some of the, the higher education sector in Scotland here at the conference who are deeply concerned not only about the uh, level of interest from EU students coming to, to study here, but their ability to cooperate okay. and collaborate with other higher education institutions in terms of research grants and, and funding. Uh, Scotland's made a fantastic contribution to a lot of those kind of projects. That's the kind of thing that's being put at risk. And as people start to see the consequences of that hard Brexit that Liam Fox, Boris Johnson okay. and all others right. who have no regard at all for the way Scotland okay. voted, that's what they're game, aiming for and I think people in J Scotland just will very, reject that. Just very briefly to come back to the beginning of this conversation, there seems to be an acceptance, including within the SNP, that some aspects of the prospectus for independence, particularly the currency, were not really convincing enough. And of course we've also had the collapse in oil prices and the possibility of a large deficit in an independent Scotland. Would you, everyone keeps saying these issues have got to be addressed, um, but the problem seems to be they're not, as a matter of fact, being addressed, are they? We're not getting any answers on that. Well, the Scottish Greens, I think, are the only party who've made any credible effort to suggest an alternative economic path for Scotland that ends our reliance on fossil fuels but invests in economies and industries that will create the jobs that communities, uh, particularly those most reliant uh, to fossil fuels, uh, they need to see a, a positive future rather than, uh, as with previous waves of deindustrialisation, people just being left on the economic scrap okay. heap. We're also trying to, to do work, and we'll continue that during this year, uh, on the alternatives of currency. But the, the idea of a currency union uh, with a non-EU member state, if we were to become independent and seek to be a full EU member, I, I, I think that's even more problematic than it was in 2014. So uh, I'm glad that there's some willingness to start finally looking at laying the groundwork for the other options that need to be made credible, need to be made realistic options for Scotland. All right, Patrick, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much. I'm sure the sun is about to come out. Thank you. Now.